Hey everyone, it's Patrick. Just a disclaimer, when we recorded this interview, there was a lot of interference we noticed after the files were uh, downloaded. So this interview might sound a little bit choppy, but it's the best we could do with uh, the limitations of our recording setup. It's still totally high yield and listenable. I just wanted to give you a warning. And you know, I have to mention that you can get even more high yield learning on the go with the Inside the Boards app and our all audio cue bank. Click the link in the show notes or search Apple's App Store for Inside the Boards, all one word. Welcome to the Inside the Boards Study Smarter series dedicated to helping you learn to think like a question writer so you can study smarter, not harder, and succeed on your exam. All right, welcome to the Inside the Board Study Smarter series for the USMLE Step 1 and Comlex Level 1. I'm here today with Dr. Karen Shackelford, who is part of Board Vitals, who's agreed to uh, help us out and cover some cardiology questions for the board. So, uh, Dr. Shackelford, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me, Patrick. It's good to be on. Absolutely. So before we get into some of our questions today, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, uh, I started full-time at Board Vitals just the beginning of this month. I've worked for with Board Vitals for about four years. Uh, I trained in emergency medicine and went to medical school both in Mississippi, actually later than the appropriate time, whenever my children had all started uh, school full-time. Kinder- my youngest was in kindergarten. And um, I practiced clinically for a while and went up to Pennsylvania to help take care of my father. I started writing remotely for Board Vitals and felt very fortunate that this position came open at a time that I was able to jump in and take it. Awesome. Um, And what uh, areas have you focused on uh, in writing for them? All the uh, USMLE steps or um, more emergency medicine board material? Yeah, I've done a lot of USM, uh, USMLE type questions for not just board vitals, but in the past, different board review sites, I guess, online test prep, but I've also emergency medicine. And I've been an editor with board vitals and, uh, on their medical content team for, I think, about the last three years, maybe. And so I've pretty much responded to a lot of user feedback in some of our different question banks, you know, things like even nurse practitioner uh, emergency medicine type things and, you know, uh, primary care type questions, whatever I'm able to help with or have some experience in. Well, I thank you for lending that experience and expertise to us today. So uh, I guess let's just get right into it. Okay. All right. So the first question we have here is a four-year-old male is undergoing a val evaluation for tetralogy of Fallot. The boy becomes cyanotic with light activity and is unable to keep up with the other children his age. During episodes of cyanosis, he's seen squatting down on the ground. His symptoms improve after several minutes of squatting. Which of the following best explains the reason for his improved oxygenation? So our answer choices here are... A, increased preload, B, decreased preload, C, decreased myocardial oxygen demand, D, decreased afterload, or E, increased afterload. So which of the following best explains uh, the patient's improved oxygenation with squatting uh, who has a suspected tetralogy of flow? How would you approach this question? I think the best way to think about this question is to first consider the normal flow of blood from the venous circulation through the cardiopulmonary circuit where it's oxygenated and pumped back out through the left side of the heart and the aorta. And then to consider how that flow changes in light of the anatomic abnormalities that are associated with tetralogy of flow. Tetralogy is the most common cyanotic congenital heart defect, and it consists basically of four anatomic abnormalities, a ventricular septal defect, pulmonary valve stenosis, an overriding aorta, and right ventricular hypertrophy. The compensatory right ventricular hypertrophy occurs as the pulmonary outflow tract becomes increasingly obstructed in order to generate 
increased pressure to force blood into the pulmonary circuit. Now, normally, since the right ventricular pressure is much lower than pressure on the left side of the heart, blood flows from left to right down the path of least resistance across the ventricular septal defect. In tetralogy of Fallot, as the pulmonary blood flow becomes increasingly impeded, reversal flow occurs from the right side of the heart to left across the VSD, and this re- results in shunting deoxygenated blood, which then mixes with oxygenated blood and enters the systemic circulation through the overriding aorta. Yeah. So, okay. Some first years do listen to this uh, podcast, and uh, some of these concepts may be a little um, more advanced uh, than they've learned already. But basically, what you're looking at is deoxygenated blood comes back to the heart through the right atrium into the right ventricle. And from there, it will go to the lungs, become oxygenated oxygenated, return to the left atrium, go into the left ventricle, and then be pumped out to feed the body tissues uh, the oxygen that they need. Is that a good kind of summary? I think, first of all, you have to think, what, you know, what causes this cyanosis? So the clinical features of tetralogy, generally, including the onset and severity of cyanosis in infants and children, generally depend upon the degree of right ventricular outflow tract obstruction. But even children who are asymptomatic or who have only mild to moderate obstruction yet have an unrepaired uh, defect will experience episodes of hypercyanosis. These episodes appear to result from transiently increased obstruction of the right ventricular outflow tract to the point of near occlusion and often occur during feeding in infants or when infants are crying and with physical exertion in older children. Older children typically learn to squat until they recover. And the mechanism by which this occurs is an increase in the systemic vascular resistance that occurs with squatting. That reflects the afterload, which is the pressure against which the heart contracts to eject blood into the aorta during systole. Increased afterload pushes blood back across the VSD into the right heart, where it's diverted or pushed into the pulmonary vascular bed for oxygenation, thus improving oxygen saturation, right? So when there's a a VSD, that right-sided deoxygenated uh, blood in the normal state flows and mixes with the uh, left ventricle, so you get a less amount of oxygenated blood to go to the tissues and hence cyanosis. As you were saying, increasing the um, afterload kind of puts pressure so that the blood within the left ventricle goes back to the right ventricle and gets pumped into the lung so more of it can be oxygenated. Is that a good kind of summary? I think it's worthwhile looking at the effect of squatting on a murmur heard in infants and children with Tetralogy of Fallot. The murmur of Tetralogy of Fallot is usually described as a harsh systolic ejection murmur, and it's best heard at the left sternal border. It's caused by right ventricular outflow obstruction, not by flow across the VSD. Whenever the patient squats and shunts blood back into the right heart, this results in increased blood flow with turbulence through the stenotic pulmonic valve, increasing the intensity of the murmur. Let's look at the other answers. Reduced preload is one of the options, and it's incorrect, uh, as it refers to reduction of venous return to the heart, resulting in reduction of both right and left ventricular volume, and that would not result in increased oxygenation. With increased preload, you could postulate that increased right-sided pressure might drive blood into the pulmonary circulation, but at the same time, it can also drive blood from right to left across the VSD. Another answer option is decreased afterload, which would simply facilitate shunting of deoxygenated blood from the right to the left heart. I would say another thing to point out as far as uh, the boards go in reviewing this stuff is that one of the findings on uh, imaging with tetralogy classically is the boot-shaped heart on an x-ray. Yes, yes. Um, At least for boards, um, that's probably a a pretty good uh, summary of the high-yield points. I would say probably as well. I think that 
the rapid administration of prostaglandins uh, after birth in a child who is cyanotic at birth is dependent on on the uh, patent ductus arteriosus for you know for blood flow at all. That's a, a I think a critical point, and yeah. I think um, to rapidly uh, infuse prostaglandins to keep the ductus open. So yep. yeah. And then sometimes I like to point out tangential essentials and the corollary of the point about prostaglandins is don't forget that the drug of choice to rapidly close a PDA um, when you need to is uh, an NSAID, specifically indomethacin. Exactly. Uh, well, let's, let's move on to the next one. 40-year-old male presents to his primary care physician for an annual examination. He has no past medical history, although his family history includes diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and coronary artery disease. Whew, it's quite the uh, hand of cards to be dealt. Uh, <laughs> chilling, chilling history. <laughs> right. <laughs> his blood pressure is normal. His hemoglobin A1C is 5%. The results of his fasting lipid studies are um, as follows. His total cholesterol is 230. His LDL is 180, his HDL is 60, and his triglycerides are 160. In addition to dietary changes and an improved exercise regimen, he elects to begin pharmacotherapy. This patient would most likely benefit from treatment with a drug having which of the following mechanisms of action? So which mechanism, which drug's mechanism of action will improve the, I guess, lipid profile that this, this patient has with an elevated LDL, uh, high HDL? That's normal triglycerides, correct? Yes. Uh, mildly elevated, borderline elevated triglycerides, but nothing that suggests um, familial hypertriglyceridemia or anything like that. Okay. So yeah, our problem is the LDL uh, cholesterol, which basically is the uh, one type of cholesterol that you that treatment has really shown uh, a benefit. So let's uh, look at the answer choices here. We have A, inhibition of cholesterol absorption in the small intestine, B, inhibition of HMG-CoA reductase, C, partial inhibition of the release of fatty acids from adipose tissue, or D, increased tissue sensitivity to insulin. All right, what about this one? Uh, what do we have to be thinking about with uh, this patient who has a strong family history of risk factors for coronary artery disease and an elevated LDL? Okay, so um, he uh, has elected to begin pharmacotherapy, and technically, uh, I won't get into calculating like a 10-year uh risk of coronary artery disease, but just take that at his face. He's decided to take uh, an anti-cholesterol medication. So I would go through the choices and basically probably know what it is, you know, know what the medication is. They probably understand that a statin is the best drug, you know, most frequently prescribed for primary and secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease in patients who don't have evidence of coronary artery disease. Only management of LDLC cholesterol, you know, has been shown to be of any clinical benefit. So, uh, I, you know, the easiest way to do that would be well. So, if you know that answer, you uh, automatically, you know, go to inhibition of HMG CoA reductase because that's how statins work. And the other option is, you know. In, as in taking any test, is to rule out, you know, read through the other choices. Uh, what kind of drug, for example, upregulates um, lipoprotein lipase, like fibrates, uh, and they increase triglyc uh, triglyceride clearance, but that would not be the, the drug. Increased tissue sensitivity to insulin is a kind of a bad distractor because it's fairly obvious, it, it should be fairly obvious that that would not be uh, the way to lower his cholesterol. Um, so, but that's the mechanism, mechanism that metformin uses. It re, uh, increases tissue sensitivity to insulin. Choice C, which would be partial inhibition of release of free fatty acids from tissues, is part, it's thought to be part of the mechanism of action of niacin, although uh, it's not 100% clear how niacin works to lower cholesterol. 
but uh, it also increases lipoprotein lipase activity. Niacin is most useful for uh, increasing levels of HDL cholesterol, but you know, that's not the issue here. The guy's HDL cholesterol is is good. The patient, it's it, enviable. Uh, yeah, very nice. Um, you know, it does lower LDL cholesterol, but again, and it lowers LDL cholesterol a good bit, but again, it, it doesn't show cardiovascular benefit. I mean, there's a benefit to just lowering the LDLC, but really, uh, statins are the only uh, medication that ha- have shown uh, like a survival, cardiovascular survival benefit in lowering LDLC. So that for secondary prevention, and that's secondary prevention. He doesn't have coronary artery disease, but again, statins are really the only medication that that have been um, shown to have this proven survival benefit. So that's going to be the choice. They're widely prescribed. So again, how do they work? HMG CoA reductase inhibitor competitively inhibit hydroxymethylglutarol CoA reductase which is like the rate limiting step of cholesterol synthesis right at the beginning whenever uh, you know it effectuates the conversion of 3 hydroxy 3 methylglutarol CoA to mevalonate and um, this results in reduction of the intracellular cholesterol levels activates a protease and basically ends up uh, cleaving sterol binding proteins from the endoplasmic reticulum this eventually ends up through a complex you know, molecular process or a cellular process, increasing LDL receptor uh, gene expression. That increases the LDL uh, receptor-mediated endocytosis and lowers serum LDL that way. So that's how that works. So it's a little bit more than just um, inhibiting HM- HMG-CoA reductase, but that's really the main thing you need to know. And everything else, um, I doubt would be asked on this. I'm sure we all learned it at one time, but I think that the key point is that it's HMG-CoA reductase and statins are the most beneficial cholesterol-lowering medication in terms of reduction of um, cardiovascular events and with the mortality and morbidity benefit, actually. So, yeah. All right. And then I guess just uh, one point uh, the students can take away um, from this episode and carry with them to exam day is niacin. It seems that in the review books, uh, one of the things that uh, the the material tends to cover is niacin can cause facial flushing and you can decrease that by pre-treating with an NSAID. Right. That's a a good point. Um, Yeah. But I will not get into the mechanism for that. Um, number one, I don't know that it's known. And number yeah, I two... Don't, I don't it's clear. Yeah. Number two, I, I read this question and I think, thank God, I guess, that I'm an OBGYN. And, and secondly, uh, my heart goes out to all those second years who will be taking step one soon. <laughs> yeah, um, true. The basic yeah. science years are a lot of memorization. I would say the other thing um, about niacin, a question that we always see from our users is, uh, you know, isn't this what you use or is it like a fibrate what you use whenever you have high triglycerides? Well, the point being that lowering triglycerides, uh, unless you have something like familial hypertriglyceridemia, it really does not have a a cardiovascular benefit, doesn't have a, a mortality benefit. So, you know, for mild to moderate, hypertriglyceridemia, usually uh, it's not even treated except with a statin, which kind of works all around on both LDL triglycerides and increasing uh, HDLC. All right. That's good. Let's move on uh, to our next question then. All right. And that's it for today. We'll be back with part two of our interview for the Study Smarter Series 2019 with Dr. Shackelford from Board Vitals on our next episode in a couple days. And hey, I know you're busy, but I cannot overestimate how important it is for us to receive ratings and reviews on Apple Podcasts. We've got four podcasts in our family now, Physiology by Physio, The Medical Nemonist, The Inside the Board's main podcast, and of course, this channel, the Study Smarter Podcast. When you leave a rating and a review on Apple, it helps us rise in the rankings on the iTunes medicine charts, 
as well as provides data for our potential sponsors, which help us connect you with products and services we feel like would be a good fit for our audience to make your lives a little bit better, which is, you know, kind of our shtick here. Plus, your feedback is invaluable for us in how we can improve this show, improve our app, improve our audio cue bank, and make Inside the Boards truly the best high-yield resource for on-the-go USMLE, Comlex, and Med School study. So please, if you have not, take a minute, you know, of course, if you're not driving, leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts, help ITB out. And on that note, we are always looking for people who have talents that they would volunteer to use for inside the boards, especially those with talents in art, humor, design, or who have an interest in helping develop our audio cue bank and produce other content. You get a chance to work with some luminaries in the medical education space, contribute to a company that is truly trying to improve the lives of medical students first and foremost, and we can make the opportunity and position a real benefit to you on, for instance, a residency application. So if you're interested in helping Inside the Boards, send us an email to info at insidetheboards.com. As always, we thank you for listening and truly appreciate your support.